Thanks a lot. All right, uh, good afternoon. I'm Chris Moffitt, and I'm one of the uh, creators and lead developer on Satchmo, and uh, Bruce will kind of introduce himself, too. I'm Bruce Cruzy. I think I'm the only person in the world who makes a full-time living from Satchmo right now, and I'm one of the core developers on, on the project. So we're going to kind of uh, tag team this. I'll do the intro and uh, just uh, you know a little bit about what we're trying to do here. Um, first, before I go into it too much, can, can you raise your hand if you've actually used Satchmo? Oh, great. OK. So we've got pieces of this that will be targeted towards folks that uh, are using Satchmo and have some familiarity with it. It'll also hopefully be a good introduction. And then even if you have no desire to use Satchmo, Satchmo, by version of being one of the larger projects, is going to use a lot of different components of Django. And hopefully, you'll take away a few things here that you can learn maybe in, on uh, some of your other projects. So we'll go through uh, a, a brief history. It'll mirror a lot of what uh, Jacob and Adrian talked about just a little bit ago. We'll talk about some of our uh, unique features, some of the challenges we face as a larger project, and then a little bit about the future. So <laughs> as I was going through and Putting this presentation together, um, I thought it was really kind of interesting to go back and look at the Google Groups. And I found my original post to the uh, Django users group where, um, frustrated by some of my experiences with setting up a competitive um, uh, technology shop, I posted this uh, email saying, hey, does anyone else want to get together and try and build an online shop? And when I looked at that, doing that April 2006, I kind of have mixed emotions. One, when I originally posted that, I figured, you know, Six months later, we'd probably be done. There wouldn't be anything left to do. But then when I think about it, you know, it, two years later, I guess I never would have expected that I'd be standing here at DjangoCon getting a chance to talk about this and that there would actually be a large number of people interested in hearing about it. So um, in, in some ways, it's taken a lot longer than I expected. In other ways, it's far exceeded my expectations for what we would do with uh, this framework. The other thing that um, I thought was kind of funny is, uh, Jacob kind of talked, or I guess Adrian talked a little bit about naming. And I found this post where the name for Satchmo came up. So we went through the same process of trying to come up with names. We decided we were going to follow on the uh, Django naming convention. So we constrained our choices quite a bit. But uh, this was the post from Jeremy Jones and uh, kind of how Satchmo got started. So just a little bit of history there and uh, hopefully interesting to everybody. So what, it, what is uh, Satchmo? So it is a Django-based framework for developing um, unique and highly customized e-commerce sites. Kind of what, uh, what we found in, in our experience is most of the time people come up with this idea, hey, I just want to put something on the web and sell it. But it's normally integrated with another site. It seems like you always have some sort of unique functionality that you need to put in place for your uh, business needs. And so it, it, it seems like the, the off-the-shelf ones or the uh, existing frameworks are not very easy to, uh, to customize. So, Jeng, so Satchmo is trying to allow you to customize the uh, shop for your unique needs. Along that lines, it really is designed more for developers. If you are, let's say, trying to put together a shop for your grandma and she wants to sell her crochet um, oven mitts, it's probably going to be a little too much effort, not worth the time and investment to put together a, a Satchmo store. Not to say you can't do it, but that's not really who we're geared towards. If you don't know Python, if you're not interested in uh, deploying Django in this fashion, we're not saying you can't do it, but we're really making some assumptions that you have the capability to install Django, install Satchmo, edit files, those kinds of things. So in this e-commerce space, there's, there's a lot of options, and that's kind of where we're we're targeting. Um, right now, our Google group has close to 600 users, so pretty uh, pretty impressed with that. Bruce was just talking to me about this uh, nine production sites. Um, he he claims that he has over nine himself, so I think that this number nine is um, probably pretty low, but these are the ones that are featured on the uh, Satchmo website. It's also translated into a lot of uh, languages, about a dozen or so right now. And it's preparing for its 1.0 release. Um, we just recently made all the changes to Satchmo so it will run with Django 1.0. So that was a, a lot of work the past, uh, 
past few weeks, but we're, we're really happy now and can kind of move forward and focus on uh, 1.0. I don't want to go through all the features. You can see these on the website, but these are some of the ones that are a little more um, unique that are uh, tailored to Satchmo that you may not see in other sites. Others are, are fairly standard e-commerce uh, type functions. We're going to talk a little bit more about the different components of Satchmo and how do you figure out what goes into core and it's some of the same challenges that Django deals with. But we have uh, a bunch of core applications. We also have some non-core applications that are completely independent. If you don't want to use them, you don't have to. If you want to, you can. And then we use middleware context processors to try and uh, decouple those applications. We also use signals quite a bit and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So one of the things I wanted to step through, just a real quick example of, hey, if you want to do some sort of unique feature that Satchmo doesn't do right now, how would you, how would you go about doing it? So this specific example is if you wanted to have a shop, it's a, a physical brick and mortar store, and they decide, you know what, we want to allow people to order something over the web, but walk into the store and pick it up so they don't have to pay for shipping. So right now, Satchmo doesn't do this, but it's pretty simple to create your own module to do this. And I'm going to walk through some of the high levels there. And as a cool reason, uh, when, when I was putting this together, I used the Google Maps API to, to do this. So it was a good chance for me to learn something new and mention Google's name one, once again. So um, creating the custom shipping model is pretty straightforward. You copy the kind of a, a template module that's out there. Um, there's a lot of boilerplate code. But really, there's only two files that you really care about. It's the config file and the shipper file. We're going to talk some more about the um, Satchmo configuration system, which is really, um, really a cool feature of Satchmo. Bruce put that in, and uh, it, we'll go into some more detail. I think people find that pretty interesting. So the, the pickup shipper code is pretty straightforward. These four, first four or this first page really just kind of has some boilerplate, pretty straightforward what it's telling you. But really the, the interesting piece is um, the, the shipper code is, there's a valid call before it's actually rendered. So then we can go and check and see, hey, someone says they're at this address. We can use the Google Map API to figure out how far they are from our current address and return a true or false if it's within the uh, specific uh, distance that we, we enter in the configuration app. So it's kind of, a, it, really the meat of it is probably those, I don't know, eight or so lines to uh, call the Google app API, see where our current address is, see what the distance is, return it true and false. So you'll notice here we've got this config value, shipping Google API key, shipping local pickup distance. This is the configuration module that we talked about. Bruce will talk a little bit more about it, but I'm sure you've all kind of been in that situation. You've got a Django project, you have some sort of config file that you've um, entered information in and you expect that people are going to want to modify that going forward. But how do, you, how do you draw the line about modifying a config file versus actually using the admin interface to uh, enter these values? So this, this allows you to do that. And this is the uh, configuration code that it uses and there's, you know, it's pretty straightforward, really. You've got the, uh, the variable, you've got some default text, you've got some help text that gets rendered in the admin. So uh, I'll show that in a little bit. So this is the opportunity for you to configure what the fee is if they pick it up, what kind of distance, so you can configure this. You might say, I will only want to allow people within five miles or 10 kilometers, whatever, but you may decide to change that later on. You don't want to have to go in and modify code. You can go into the admin interface and change this automatically. Once you're done with this, you need to enable the local pickup module. There's a, uh, within the Satchmo settings file, there's a custom shipping module um, uh, list. You just add that module to it, and uh, then Satchmo will automatically pick that up and make it available. And then within the admin interface, you're gonna have the option to look at all the different modules that are available. So you can see I've got a FedEx model, a UPS model, a flat rate per piece, my local pickup one that I created. And you can pick and choose which ones you want to use. Because you may decide that for this store, everybody needs to come and pick it up. That's fine. You could decide that UPS is what you want to do. You could create a custom uh, module. You've also got the opportunity to enter your API key and uh, the different fees and things like that. 
So I'll, I'll turn it over to Bruce. He's going to talk a little bit more about that uh, configuration module and also some of the other um, unique uh, aspects of Satchmo. So Bruce. When I first started working on Satchmo pretty much full time, one of the problems was that various customers would want new features or they would want they wouldn't want us to add things that were would require new settings. And it got really awkward. Uh, Guido was talking in his keynote about liking short settings files. And I like them too. I like them because I don't have to restart the, the store. I don't like to have to restart the store just because I wanted to add a new little thing or just turn off a feature or turn on a feature. So I started looking around for a solution. I wanted a live settings app an app that would allow me to change variables that are used by different parts of the store uh, and not have to make backward compatible, incompatible changes to the main shop model or, or to the settings file. So I wrote this app based really heavily on uh, another Django app called DB Settings. And I took it in a radically different path than the original author did. Uh, and he's since. Um, folding some of those changes back into his app. So kind of a good open source success story there. We, uh, so we use that for pretty much configuring all interesting store specific information. Uh, this is also so multi-site aware. So if you have multiple shops set up on one Django instance, you can have different variables that apply to each shop. So this is good. And another really interesting bit is that it knows about prerequisites. When you were looking at his uh, his example code there, that requires value thing, it's a little bit awkward looking, but basically it's saying only show these values if that that module is is a selected module that's enabled. So in in that case, it wouldn't even show the whole section unless that module was enabled which is just something you can't easily do with normal new forms admin. We, uh, and everything in it is really heavily cached. And evidently, according to the uh, high performance Django uh, presentation today, we're caching properly. So that's good. I, I'm really, I was really pleased about that. <laughs> so I've gone over all these uh, features here. So I mentioned caching. We took a, a step of making our own caching abstraction layer. And it's, it's a pretty great layer. I really like it. It uh, provides a consistent way for us to approach caching. We have a consistent way that we cache objects. We have a mix-in that you can put on a, on our, on a model, cached object mix-in, which will automatically give it a regular key which will automatically enable you to do cache deletes and cache resets with single calls from inside the model and, and have it be aware of what its cache key will be. And I guess we don't have a screenshot of it, but, the stat, but when you're using our caching app, you automatically get a view of the cache status. So you can see how many keys are currently in cache, whether your backend cache is up or down, which is actually really important because sometimes it crashes or you're wondering why it's running slow. Maybe the cache isn't up. And you can reset it. You can manually clear. You can clear subsets of the cache out right from that little admin app. Oop. All right, so payment modules. We have several right now. Uh, and they use various different, uh, various different backends. So, Authorize is probably the most often used credit card one. And it just uses kind of a back-end URL posting. Uh, Cybersaurus uses XML messages. So are we doing that with just templates, or are we doing that with elementary as well? Uh, just templates, elementary, parsing. OK, right. So we kind of found that it was overkill for us to manually build XML for the submits. So we just use the, the Django template language to build the XML. It's really great and easy to do uh, for actually posting the, the requests for CyberSource. And then using some extra features and hooks, 
we can do Google Checkout and PayPal. I keep intending to write one for Amazon. And yeah, and then there's Trust Commerce, which I haven't played with very much. OK, so signals in Satchmo. When I've been talking to people at the convention here so far, it's been really interesting to me. A lot of people will kind of look a little bit blank and say, I haven't had really a chance to mess around with signals yet, which is really too bad because, man, do I like signals. And we are going to be using way more signals in the future. Uh, during the Django 1.0 recent push to release, we ran into an issue where we had some circular dependencies. And it's just it's easy to happen in a larger project. And through the use of signals, I was able to actually kill those out with a day of work. And I was really impressed. And I was really happy with it. The, uh, it clears up responsibilities. And it helps us, we're going to talk about this in, the, in some future slides, but it really helps us keep a core store, which does a known thing, process, orders, maintain products, but also enable us to have add-ons which are not usable or interesting to maybe the majority of users, but critical for some. And through the use of signals, we can support those people without having to make them, without having to hack the internal code. Uh, one of the people that I was talking to this weekend was saying that that was one thing that he really liked about Satchmo was that he was able to actually deploy a store without ever touching the core code. He didn't have to go hack anything. Everything he wanted to do, he could do either using signals or just template tags. So I thought I'd give an example of a signal usage. This is a real example. It's for a client that I was working on last week. This site sells loyalty cards. They want to be able to sell the loyalty card as a product, and then it's actually physically delivered to the, to the person. And it contains a code, and later in the future when you make orders, you can put in that code, and it'll give you a discount on your order. We have a discount model, and we have uh, support for you know, taking codes for pretty complex discounts. But how do we automatically generate that code? How do we attach it to the order in this kind of custom situation? So, what I did is I just listened for our order success signal. I think that's the most heavily used signal for external apps at this point. I would just wait for the order success signal, which happens post-payment. I would look through the cart, look through the, the successful order, see if there was any loyalty card orders, and if so, for everyone, go make a unique code for it, make sure that it's actually unique, uh, create the discount, and then update the order with the information about what the, the discount code is, and then email the code to the fulfillment house so they could print the card and send it to the person. And I was really shocked. I actually had quoted the customer seven hours for that, and I did it in an hour and a half because it was really simple. <laughs> it ended up being literally two modules, two files, and four functions. Another one was custom tiered pricing. So another client wanted to have a situation where he had uh, vendors versus normal customers. And a vendor would get a different price. So how do you do that without having to mess up your models with having uh, multiple uh, price lookups and all kinds of interesting bits for people who don't want to do that? Pe pe normal stars that are just selling some t-shirts or some books or whatever, they don't need that. And we didn't want to build it into the core app. It's just it's too much, and it just gets too ugly. So what I did for this customer is use a different signal, Satchmo price query. And that query is, is used in various places, but the most interesting one is right before you're about to show a price to a user on a page. And it gives the price so far. <laughs> it gives the, the uh, product that's about to get queried and the current user to you know, via the signal. So I have a listener listening, and the listener gets the opportunity to modify the price at the last second, right before display to the user. And, and we use it again when we're doing the final cart calculation and, and things like that. But I was really pleased that that came together so quickly. And it only took two hours. Uh, it has a custom model, because I have to maintain prices for those products. But it's really straightforward. And again, just through the use of signals, I was able to do this without having to put any more hooks without having to modify any core code. All right, so I wrote a blog app, Banjo, 
and I doubt anybody's using it yet. I think there's one other person in the world using it right now. It was really so that I could do stuff like this, which is uh, Satchmo stores often want to have a blog. And so I use this as an interesting uh, example because sometimes people say they want a blog, and really all they want to do is just have a news feed. And in that case, fine, go ahead and use WordPress or something, and then just use an RSS feed and stick it on your store. But if you actually wanted to integrate it, if you actually wanted the blog to do something with your store that's different from just having posts, then how would you do that? Well, again, you would use, uh, in this case, you would use template tags. So what I did is uh, blog entries already have tags. So I just would, I made it so that uh, I could grab those tags out and then look to see if there was any slugs or of products or any categories. And if so, show them in the right nav uh, of the page where the blog entry is. So you could make a blog about your fancy new corset. This is for a corset site. Your fancy new corset. And on the right hand, it would show the various corsets that correspond with what you're talking about, which I thought was pretty slick. And uh, I had to install the blog, and I had to figure out my strategy. So maybe that took me th three hours. But I, I, I was really pleased with it, and it, work, and it works. Uh, really well. So I thought I would talk about how I integrated Banjo uh, and how I did that. Is There's a few more in, uh, apps. There's a couple of context processors. I made a, a template tag library, as I was just describing. And then uh, I overrode the base index. And that was all I had to do. So, I don't remember when it was. We were at, what was it, 0.6 release? I made a post to the Satchmo dev list talking about what the problem was for the feature. And the problem was, how were we going to maintain, or what direction did we want to go? Did we want to be a small shop? Did we want to be able to just help uh, Joe sell some t-shirts? Did we want to be a medium-sized shop? Or did we want to handle whatever enterprise means? Uh, and there was a lot of talk about it. Uh, eventually, we didn't come to a conclusion. <laughs> I'd like to say we did, but basically, the conclusion is kind of a more of a working conclusion. And that is, we will remain usable by small shops. The core Satchmo is going to work standalone without having to do any crazy stuff or do stuff just because enterprise people might need it. However, I will add contributions, we will accept contributions, provide any functionality if they meet those criteria. And it is amazing. It's very amazing how far signals plus template tags will take you without having to modify the core. We're, uh, so we're growing by basically allowing optional extended features, which hopefully don't modify the core, because at this point, the core is getting pretty solid. We have some future stuff we're going to be changing about the products, but we wouldn't want to modify that main, that main part. Hopefully, our documentation is going to be getting a lot better now that we're using Sphinx as well. Uh, I am not the documentation guy, however. From, from a documentation perspective, we do a lot with Satchmo, once again, taking Django as our model. I mean, that, that was one of the things that really attra attracted me to Django was the quality of documentation. You go to the website, you suddenly get a lot of really good information. And uh, I think James Bennett had the, the post, or uh, this week in Django, he was talking about um, the importance of code, or er, of documentation. Getting the documentation done right really drives getting the code done right. So. I wish I could say that Satchmo is as good as Django. It's not, um, but that is a model, and we have something to strive for. Um, but a lot of the technologies that Django uses is what we use. So we use restructured text. It's really nice. It's it's uh, you know just plain text. It's easy to update. It's easy to view on the web. But we also started using Sphinx to present it nicely. And as was mentioned earlier in the keynote over lunch, Sphinx is really an amazing tool. It uh, one it really helps with the presentation. 
It does a lot of things with cross-referencing um, and um, also standalone documentation generation. So if you haven't taken a look at it, if you have a project, I highly recommend you uh, take a look at that and see what Django's done too. They've done an amazing job customizing Sphinx for their unique needs. We also try, you know, I think a lot of people forget that the built-in admin interface has a lot of documentation in place already on tags and filters and things like that, and trying to make sure you just do the right thing and put your comment strings in the right place in the code so it actually does show up in the admin interface is really important. And then one of the biggest challenges we've had right now is trying to figure out what's the right level of documentation. If you look on our mailing list, probably the majority of the questions that come up are newbies just trying to get the thing installed. So it, one hand, it's great that people are coming to Django and Python through Satchmo, but on the other hand, we're you know trying to walk someone through getting Python installed, getting the library dependencies. Um, you want to make it as simple as possible, but um, we spent probably more time on that than documenting the internals like Bruce talked about with the signals and um, extending template tags and things like that. So we need to do some more work on, on beefing that up. But um, I, I think we've got the right framework in place from the technologies we're using, so hopefully that will uh, improve in the future. So what does the future bring? Um, <laughs> the road to Django 1.0 was pretty bumpy for those of you that actually were on the mailing list and were trying to use Satchmo the last couple weeks. Thanks for hanging in there. I appreciate it because I know it was, uh, it was bumpy. It seemed like every day we'd feel like, okay, it's working with Trunk, and then someone would say, now it's not. And then mostly Bruce and some other folks would go in there and try and figure out how to, how to make it all work. But now um, Satchmo does run on Django 1.0, and that's what we're planning to do going forward. Um, I talked about documentation. Definitely going to continue to add uh, improvements there so it's clear for people how they want to extend their shops. The uh, Probably one of the biggest things, kind of the biggest wart right now with Satchmo is the product model. And um, we, you know, I when I originally created the product model, I was thinking about the t-shirt model. And so the t-shirt model is you've got a shirt, you've got sizes, you've got colors, and you've got designs. And in the end, you know, from a user interface perspective, when you're on the website, you normally want to have the, the two or three drop downs and, and choose it. But then on the back end, you actually need to have the inventory for each of those product because it is a unique physical thing. So we wanted to make it easy for someone to say, hey, here's a t-shirt, here are my three sizes and two colors and automatically generate all the products. And that works pretty well, but then that's not really a product model that's optimized for someone that's making a downloadable product or um, a subscription product. And so we've continually kind of added on to the product model to where we do have all those features. The problem is the, you, you'll find the place in the code where we're checking if it's this certain product type, do something. If it's this, this product type, do another thing. And it's just not really as elegant as we'd like. It's not as simple as it should be for people to add their own uh, product model. We're getting better, but um, that, that's definitely one of the, the big things we'd like to work on. The other big one is uh, the admin interface. Uh, Bruce has done a nice job creating some special views um, within the admin interface, but we haven't done a whole lot of customization using New Forms Admin yet. And we've, we've obviously been holding off on that until New Forms Admin was merged. Now that it is, we're kind of going to have more free reign to go in and streamline the admin interface, make it work more efficiently for real world, real world business situations. The, um, um, I just lost my train of thought. So that's, uh, you know, in a nutshell, what we're looking for from, for the future. Um, so I think I talked about most of these um, from a product model. The um, uh, Josh Ginsberg, so JAG, is uh, here in the audience also. And he's been working. He, he's the individual that deployed the uh, Satchmo instance for the Free Software Foundation. I think he's going to talk a little bit more about that later. But he's been working on some really uh, cool custom admin features to uh, have a multi-tab interface to allow you to modify orders after they've been submitted. And that's some work that's uh, pretty far along and will hopefully be making it into Satchmo soon. And I think will really be uh, more useful for real-world situations, especially dealing with 
uh, you know, kind of complex things that happen after someone places an order and they change their mind on what they want, they change the discounts, uh, you know, complain about uh, something. So that will be a very uh, much appreciated and much useful feature once it's added. Oh, and then the, uh, the product manager, that's what I was going to say a minute ago. Right now, um, we've talked about this. I, I don't know if anyone else has any experience with this, but probably the, the most number of items that we have in a Satchmo store is probably, what, two, three hundred? Is that, and, and people have talked about, hey, I want to have a store with 10,000 items. Um, and, and I think the underlying architecture can probably scale okay, but the interface, the admin interface is not conducive to managing that many items. So that's something we need to uh, work on, and I think a lot of the new forms admin hooks and uh, customization that's now available to us will really help us there. And then finally, reporting. I, I know this is one that uh, we've kind of stayed away from because it's hard to try and figure out from a reporting perspective, what are people really going to want to do um, to, to look at their sales? How, what are they going to really want to report on from a Satchmo perspective? What are they going to have an external ERP or a bookkeeping system to, uh, to use? So uh, I think the kind of middle ground that we're going to take is to try and put some more hooks in place, try and uh, illustrate how we would do it, but not um, build a whole reporting package on top of Satchmo. I just think that's uh, that's way too much work and not something that we can really take on right now with the size of the team. And then maybe uh, you want to talk about this, Bruce, sure. since you're working on that? Actually, I wrote this slide, and these are just things that I'm excited about doing. Uh, I wanted to say most of Satchmo is Chris kept using the word real world, and it was on the title of several apps. Most of Satchmo is really built around real world usage. It has less to do with what we as developers think ought to be in a store, and more to do with what actual clients and real stores need. And I think that's been one of the really strong parts about, about Satchmo. Uh, as a full-time developer, most things that I contribute are actually contributed by clients. And the way that I do that is I just give them a 25% discount on my rate if they'll do it. And that's a huge discount, but it benefits me and it benefits the this, this Satchmo community. So, you know, I don't re contribute ridiculous things, but I try to generalize them and add features that are really usable and try to, in a general way, that will be useful for other people using the store. So these are all things that I guess a couple of them are things that clients have requested, and a couple of them are just things that I think will be fun to do. The, I actually do have a client that wants to use Satchmo as the back end for a Flash store, which may or may not be a good idea, but it will be really fun to write the XML RPC interface to, do, to have it all be remote controllable via XML RPC. Maybe, that is, maybe I'm a masochist to think XML RPC is going to be really fun, but I have some familiar... <laughs> I have some familiarity with it from Banjo, and it wasn't too bad, so I'm pretty hopeful. The desktop product manager, again, that's just something I think might be fun. It would use the same interface. And you know, I like new forms admin. I'm also thinking that it might be an interesting way, an interesting use of like Air, Air or something to build a desktop uh, product manager <clears throat> that doesn't have to be quite so stateless, that could be able to page through products and things and be a lot uh, faster and more intuitive. And an interface for reporting tools would be really nice. Unfortunately, I'm not uh, enormously familiar with reporting, so I'm going to need some help in that area. And then I was, I'm was i planning to do a uh, JSON interface so that I can do some store status widgets. I think those will be really fun and interesting where a store owner could just have a little widget on their on their desktop that would say, oh, you made a sale. Oh, your current top items are these. You're running out of inventory on these things. And I haven't seen any other open source app uh, even talk about doing that. And I think, A, it's actually pretty easy. And B, those are kind of fun to do. So I'll probably do that one uh, just on my own. All right, so um, we've got a little bit of time. Wanted to do that on purpose to make sure we had uh, opportunity to ask questions. So if anyone here has questions about Satchmo or um, general open source, uh-oh, who's coming up? Oh, okay.
Okay, sorry. I've done some um, e-commerce shopping cart stuff, um, so I have like a bazillion questions for you. So okay. I'll probably ask on offline later. Um, I find that one of the hardest things to do about that is actually um, creating the interface for the store owner. Um, so I was curious, first of all, how like what kind of stuff do you have to handle images? Like, do you allow multiple images per item? Do you allow them to resize them? All that kind of stuff. Sure. So from an image perspective. Um, we originally used Nesh's thumbnail. I think, you know, if you've been around a while, that was kind of the first thumbnail implementation. And we do have the product model because one of the big limitations of, of OS Commerce, which is the one that I used at the time, it was really difficult to attach multiple images. So with Satchmo, you can have as many images as you want. The recent new forms admin change makes it a lot easier to actually delete images. So, you know, you used to have to um, figure out what field was the core equals true and delete that, and that caused a lot of problems. So now you can add and delete as many images as you want, and uh, through the templates you can you can display them. So I think that part works, uh, works pretty well right now. Um, I don't know if anyone actually uses this anymore, but um, Frugal has a feed, like you can send it a feed of your products. Does Satchmo do that? Yeah. Cool. Um, yes. And then, not to put you on the spot if you don't have it ready, but like, what does the interface look like when for a store owner to like review orders and kind of see and prepare them and that kind of stuff? Sure. So, so unfortunately, my laptop—it's kind of embarrassing to say—is not set up to run a Satchmo demo, <laughs> but uh, we can we can definitely do that at, at another time. But but right now, the uh, the order review process is just the the straight admin. So it's a pretty massive um, form that has the, the customer information, the shipping, the billing information, and then the products. Um, I mentioned that the there's a custom uh, order manager function that's kind of in the works, and I haven't seen that. I know Bruce has, and Jack's working on that right now. So we're, we're going to do some improvements to make that a little more streamlined. Thanks. Okay. Jag was talking about the Free Software Foundation. They have um, some slick hooks into our signals so that the uh, invoices and the uh, shipping documents, packing slips, are printed uh, directly to a printer and then the person that normally does that just picks it up off the printer and does the, the processing. So th that's kind of not even using the admin interface um, but the real world process. So, Are, are you the designated question asker in every talk? Well. I'm actually using Satchmo right now for, okay. for, some, for a freelance client of mine, and, and it's raised a couple of questions. One kind of a big one, and one kind of a small one. Um, the, the biggest thing that I've run into really using Satchmo, mm -hmm. and in, in a way this is kind of in the nature of what Satchmo is trying to do, is it feels sometimes like there are two different applications in Satchmo. One wants to be my entire site, and one will play along with my other applications. Mm -hmm. And trying to fit it into like like what I'm doing right now, um, integrating with a third-party CMS and a bunch of third-party applications that are running other areas of the site. I mean, all of the the tweaking and hacking of what Satchmo wanted as its URL patterns and its settings and all this mm -hmm. stuff, just to make it work. Have you considered maybe branching or otherwise finding some sort of resolution? Because it feels like there's a lot of tension it, within Satchmo between those two ways of doing things. Yeah, so th that's, a, that's a great question. If you want to comment, probably. Um, so I, I think that's a, that's a great question. That's something we've been wrestling with all along. And I, I guess w where I struggle in answering the question is, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not sure exactly what the solution is. So yeah. y you know, I, I'm sure you have some, some pretty good ideas, and I, I'd be welcome to, to, how to how to do that and how to make uh, it I a mean, little I, more. I mean, really, I see it as, as being kind of a tough spot for you guys, because there are a lot of people who are going to want to say, I, I just want a store. Right. And they're not going to want to integrate it with anything else. But right. Yeah. So yeah, I, yeah. I can see serving that, yeah. Almost none of my clients actually just want a plain store. So personally, I almost never use the base shop settings. Okay. Uh, I almost just, I always just override them, and I always just specify them in my uh, local project. Okay. It, it, it's only one file, and I just have to, to update it. It's just a, a slight inc upwards inc compatibility issue, but not that big of a deal. So that's how I handle it. Okay. 
Um, and the other thing is, is really sort of a little technical thing, and I'll, I'll happily file a ticket and argue for this. <laughs> um, in your caching system, um, if you use either the dummy backend or set cache timeout to zero, Satchmo will bomb on every request with cache not responding. And that gets really annoying when you're just trying to get an installation up and running. Is, is, there, is there a deeper reason that I missed for why it's testing that? or Because what, what it does actually, it's trying to write a value to the cache and then read it right back immediately afterwards. And neither of those will work. And then it just bombs out with an exception. I agree. I've been thinking of just having a setting that'll turn it off. OK. I think that much as I don't like settings in this case, I think that would be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're uh, developing client sites and the client comes to you with some harebrained idea that you know you might think is totally stupid, but you can't talk them out of it and uh, doesn't belong in core and uh, you know, uh, do you find times you can't handle it with your signals or template tags or something like that? How do you how do you handle that kind of you know? Do you do you kind of fork off then and build some custom feature for them, or do you find you can usually fix it with a uh, external kind of patch? It's never happened yet. Yeah. Uh, they do have harebrained ideas for sure, <laughs> uh, but. If they're really harebrained, sometimes I can talk them out of it. Sometimes I can modify it into something that isn't so harebrained. Sometimes I'm wrong, and maybe it wasn't so harebrained. And they, if they give me a good reason, then I can modify Satchmo. That has happened. Clients will have a legitimate need, and will end up modifying Satchmo based on that. But it's a careful consideration. But these days, usually I can handle it with signals and template tags. I have a um, client who has a product catalog online, which doesn't do sales online, but he has an in-store um, business where he sells all kinds of products. And wondering if it would be something even worth trying. Uh, the, the site's going to be done in Django, the website. But wondering if it'd be worth thinking about redoing his very old and outdated um, point of sale system using something like Satchimo or I don't I don't know it would have to integrate with like um, you know being able to print invoices for the customer there and or receipts and that kind of stuff so Satchimo is not a point of sale system however I do have a client that wants me to do that I said wants me to do that I haven't said I agreed uh, if I was going to do it, I would probably, I would suggest you generate the objects using Python and not try to do a big SQL map just as a suggestion. Like maybe just skip out of Django. And <laughs> well, you know, take his current app and just uh, dump it out and then maybe write some queries and make some, right. some, uh, some, it'll help you with your, just make sure all of your keys have proper references and everything. Okay. That's how I do that if I have that kind of situation. Um, has anyone looked at SMS payment support? Has there been requests or any custom tags written for that, even in Google Checkout? Because we're dealing with things where we use Google Checkout for content. And there's support for it on like YouTube if you're sponsored or something, if you're nonprofit. But I'm hoping, for the record, GPay supports and comes out soon. But we really need that because we're dealing in a hundred billion dollar industry last year. It's bumping fifty percent this year and fifty percent next year for content people. We really need it if we're going to use it for our store, especially for App Engine data support. So that's well, that's level two or whatever they call it now. Mm -hmm. uh, Google checkout support, right? Does yeah. that come with that level two? I think it does. Yeah, but I'm trying to see about wrapping an actual back-end data system that's also scalable on App Engine. Mm -hmm. And there also, I want to scale the sale API, the chart, the payment API. Because what we do is we not only let people buy content, but then they get to share it using their own unique SMS code. So uh -huh. we've got to have the data relationships, the business referral graph, basically, to cover that and send them their payment, too. It's kind of fun, because 
you actually people make money sharing and getting people to buy stuff. So it's kind of an interesting thing. But I'm just checking. Well, that. the short yeah. answer, the short yeah. answer is nobody's requested it yet. Yeah. But if I can do level two, I can do it in the API. For we don't have level two yet. I do. I'm talking about for Google Checkout. If I can do it right. Google Checkout, I can just do it level two there, write a specialized piece of API no, code and just pop it in What I'm saying is there. we don't have level two Google Checkout right now. Ugh. However, I do have a friend that's offered me the code. Okay. Uh, uh, we're the SV Web Builders. We guys have the, the Flex stuff for open social. We really, 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 really need it. <laughs> There's some really, really I, big independent content creators who really, really want to yeah. make yours a standard for their content. I, I would love to have it, okay. and I just need to get that code. They're like the only guys who are making money in the independent music and video guys. So you really, really want to get it out the door, okay? <laughs> Point taken. I do actually